Okay. Um, so uh, my talk is going to be about codes for efficient data storage on DNA molecules. I work at uh, EMBI, e uh, EMBL EBI, which is European Bioinformatics Institute, and at the University of Cambridge. This is work I've been doing at EMBL EBI. And uh, as uh, David recently told some of us, this talk is going to be about saving the world. So my mission is to save the world, and the proposition is as follows. Mankind's self-destroying, uh, and uh, we'll lose all technolo technology and, and, and knowledge, so, so, so the idea is we should really archive our information in a way that remains accessible even um, if all the current technology is lost. So, so, so magnetic recording, optical disks, probably not suitable. Uh, this isn't my mission alone. I'm not working on this by myself. I've got a whole, you know, we've got a team of, uh, it's a partnership, and uh, these are the, the, my fellow uh, conspirators, David Mackay, uh, Nick Goldman, Emily Hesketh, and, and Roland Schwartz. Uh, very, I'm very fortunate to have three of these four partners in the room here, so if you have any hard questions, I'll pass them on to them. Okay, so how do we do this? How do we safeguard mankind's information in a way that might be accessible? And the idea is use DNA. Why? Well, simply because when we finally emerge from the dark ages uh, and, and all our technology is lost, eventually whoever, whatever intelligent life form emerges will eventually learn to read um, DNA again because it's, it's how biology encodes information. So why don't we store information on DNA because mankind will naturally, or mankind or whatever kind, will naturally rediscover how to read DNA. We're not the only ones trying to save the world. Um, there's a whole, lots of people uh, uh, who are doing similar things. So the two groups here, Church and Goldman, were kind of in a little competition to get uh, the, the first, more recent uh, paper out. Uh, Church is, I think, at Harvard, and Goldman is, my, is our group at EBI. Uh, I wasn't there yet. Uh, then we have um, um, Grass. Uh, and his group in, in Switzerland, who's doing very exciting stuff, is coating DNA molecules in glass, and I'll say a few words about that again later. Uh, we have Milenkovic and her group uh, that are close to what I'm doing because they're information theorists as well, so they're really developing specific coding methods for uh, storing data on DNA. And then a very, the newcomers from Microsoft Research in Seattle, Bornholt et al. And nobody that I'm aware of in the east part, <laughs> of, but there may be some other people. Um, so, what's the idea? So we have technology nowadays to write and read DNA. Uh, I've been working with, with uh, molecular biologists recently and I've learned that you don't say write and read DNA, you say synthesize and sequence DNA. So DNA is a sequence, uh, you synthesize and you get these out of the sequence, you provide the sequence, they give you molecules, these DNA strands, and then you put it into a soup. That's a, DNA, a, a, can, a tin of DNA soup that I've stolen somewhere on the web from some artist. Uh, out of that soup, you can then amplify it. If you've got a little bit, you can make more of it. And then the final step would be sequencing, which is reading out the information back from, uh, from the, the molecules onto a sequence that you can process on your computer. And as you see, if you're lucky, you get the same sequence, but you're not always lucky in this case. It is a similar sequence, but it's not exactly the same. So, sounds like the good old storage and communication that we information theorists know. There are a few subtleties. So one thing is, for example, synthesis is still a very uh, new technology. So you can't do that yourself. You need to order it. There's a handful of companies that do it. It's slow and it's expensive, and then they send you little vials of, of, of DNA. Amplification is really easy, any lab can do it, so it's very cheap. Uh, it's, you know, initially when I started talking to these people, I said, don't do amplification, it's repeat coding, it's bad, but then they said, it costs nothing, we just, you put some salt and pepper, shake it, and, and you amplify it. So, uh, of course, you still, you might be introducing errors by doing so, so these are all things that you need to take into account. And then sequencing is specialized lab equipment still, but lots of labs have them, so you might be able to do that, that's, that's becoming get it much cheaper and, and accessible. Still, it's not something that you would do yet in your laptop, uh, the, whole, the whole process. Certainly not synthesis and se sequencing might be some way off, but, but, but it's not happening yet. Um, 
The past work that I've mentioned is mainly feasibility studies. So it's people have, have the, the initial paper I didn't mention, there was a paper in 2000 that encoded, I think, one word. Uh, but th these papers that I mentioned, they're, they're, they, they've encoded on the order of kilobytes or a few hundred kilobytes, uh, a few files, feasible, you know, proof of concept, it works, and then they retrieve them. Right? That's, that's wonderful. But normally when we sell hard disks, we don't tell people we've just tested it, we've put three files on it, we've retrieved them, it's good enough, you can have it. No, we need to, we need to make sure it works, and that's, that's the future challenge. Uh, Grass at Al. Uh, I'm always confused whether his name's glass or grass, but it's glass is the material, grass is the name, so that's... <laughs> <laughs> he codes uh, DNA molecules, individual DNA molecules in, in glass. Uh, and that was quite hard, but the harder part is melting the glass because he needs to use some chemicals that melt glass, obviously. And, and uh, chemistry people don't like to melt glass because they, they normally glass is what contains their, their chemicals. So, so he's very <laughs> clever. But the advantage of coding DNA molecules in glass is that it is robust. So one of the questions, one of the, the fallacies that we have when we speak about DNA storage, a lot of people will come and say, oh, DNA lasts forever. We read the DNA of dinosaurs. So I'm told by molecular geologists that this is not true. DNA is not a stable compound, and you do need to protect it in somehow. You can either make a lot of it, or you need to protect it, and, and Grass's work is so far quite impressive in doing that. So. The current work and, and future work that most of these groups are currently working on, and uh, as far as I know, and certainly we are, is first of all, a probabilistic characterization of the storage channel, understanding it, doing information theory on it, being able to make predictions, not that we can store one file and retrieve it, but on the order of error probabilities of 10 to the minus nine or whatever you want. Uh, dedicated coding techniques for that, and then, as I said, optimized data rates. Um, the data rates typically in wireless, spectrum is expensive. In uh, storage, it might be you know how much you can pack on on a on a disk. In DNA, some people have been um, proudly uh, trumpeting the uh, terabytes per gram, but grams don't really matter at this point <laughs> because it, it is really a very very dense storage medium. So you could really store incredible amounts of information in a given weight, but that doesn't really. Uh, give you much. The, the, the bigger problem is kilobits per dollar uh, at, at the moment. And then, and then guaranteeing reliabilities of 10 to the minus n, and at the current kilobits per dollar price, that means you can't just do that by, by actually doing a channel measurement. You, you can't actually run this unless you have unlimited uh, research funding. You can't run an experiment to do it. You need to be able to simulate it, and you need fair and accurate um, representations of the DNA storage medium in order to do that. Okay, so if we want to do this, we need to go back to information theory. We've heard uh, from Amin a little bit about information theory already. And in classical information theory is very simple. We uh, basically, we have an encoder that takes the source and then maps them onto blocks of n symbols. And information theory tells us as this n goes to infinity, uh, you can do all sorts of wonderful things. Um, and, uh, and, and you can guarantee unlimited reliability for data rates uh, approaching a physical limit known as capacity, and it's all very nice. And infinity means n has to be fairly larger than 10,000. There are codes in wireless that go down to 2,000, 3,000, but that's the order of magnitude, okay? There is another approach, which is packet coding. Uh, I mean, know something about that, so he, he's worked on, he's developed, he's been, instrumental in developing one of the methods known as fountain coding that, that does that. Also, people that worked with Reed-Solomon codes uh, know about that. So here, the only difference is you do the same as before, but instead of n binary symbols, you're really looking at words every time. These could be packets of size eight in, for Reed-Solomon codes. It could be several thousand for fountain codes. And then you also have code word lengths of the order 100 to 10,000 to for fountain codes infinity, theoretically. So that's how it works. So we, you, know, you can do one or the other. Um, so let's look at the DNA soup channel. Okay. The DNA soup channel that we are working on looks like that. You have sequences. And the order of magnitude of the sequence length of DNA is about 200. Okay. Some people can stretch it to 300. Uh, sometimes when you do the 200 and you, work to the, you talk to the molecular biologists, they say, well, I need 60 symbols at the beginning to attach this DNA to something else, and I need 60 symbols at the end, and then your 200 becomes 110. 
but that's the order of magnitude you can work with. A few hundred symbols at most, okay? And that would indicate, among the two possibilities that I mentioned here, normal symbol coding or packet coding, well, it would indicate that with normal symbol coding, you can't get anywhere. Uh, because if you're constrained to lengths on the order of 200 or less, uh, that's not going to give you the 10,000 you need for proper symbol coding. So packet coding seemed to be the way to go. So you now consider each of these packets of DNA as sort of one super symbol in your, in your encoder, okay? And the idea here, as you see, is I've numbered them, and then I'm putting them in my soup, and then I'm retrieving them. And the problem is I'm retrieving them with a fishing rod, okay? And when I retrieve them in a fishing rod, I can't say I want the first packet you wrote initially. I'm, I'm fishing whatever I'm fishing. Whatever comes out, that's what I get, okay? So the DNA soup channel has a few differences from what I said uh, before. First of all, DNA is quaternary. I wrote that because a lot of people come up to me and ask me, oh, it's not binary, that's the main problem of DNA. So no, do not worry, we can deal with quaternary symbols in coding, we've always done so, that, that is not an issue. Okay, so I wrote it and you can forget about it, quaternary is not a problem. It works just as well as binary. Um, so synthesis and sequencing, as I say, constrain DNA strand lengths in the hundreds, 100, 200, something like that. It's too short for proper coding. And it seems to be a difficult size, but feasible for packet coding. It's a bit too small for fountain coding, for example, but we can manage, uh, uh, we, we, we do manage. However, and that's the big however, and, and that, that's where we get to techniques such as fountain coding, packet order is lost in the soup. So when we retrieve them, we don't know in what order. And the other thing is identical packets, if you want to write in normal coding, there's nothing dictating that packet number 72 and packet number three that you, that you, that you transmit can't be the same. Well, if you do that in this case, they're going to be indistinguishable, right? Whatever noisy observations you had of one are going to indicate the other, so you shouldn't do that. You should pick different packets when you encode. And it took me about six months now on the project to figure all this out. Um, I remember when I went to the first meeting of the project, uh, we drove there with David, and on the way back he told me, uh, he started telling me all, that he, all of his first thoughts, and it, it had all of that. He basically immediately uh, jumped, he immediately visualized the fact that, that it's going to be a soup and you're going to be having to retrieve them in different order. And so this is what I call, when you're trying to investigate the theoretical limits for, for storage on the, on the soup channel, uh, this is what I call subset coding a la Mackay. And the idea, and that's probably the one idea I want to convey in this talk, okay? The idea is, normally, we would think as an, of an encoder as picking a, a sequence of symbols or sequence of packets. In this case, it makes no sense to pick a sequence of packets because the packets are going to come out in a different, in, in, in a random order, and if you get, if you pick the same packet twice, you're basically not making any difference. You're going to be, the, the thing that makes sense here is to think of the encoder as picking a set rather than a word, okay? So the idea is if you take the big set of all possible DNA strands of length 200 or whatever you have at your disposal, and your encoder basically picks one subset of that, right, as its code word. So instead of a code word, it's picking a code set. And for the next, for the next, uh, you know, it waits for more source input and picks another code set. And the, the decoder's role now, so the channel then mixes this all up, and the decoder gets noisy observations of the elements of this subset and needs to get, guess which subset was transmitted. Okay, so this is what I've just said, but uh, written down. So the decoder ob obtains possibly repeated noisy, noisy observations of the elements in the code set. Its role is to determine which code set the encoder selected. And in this context, the code sets take up the role of what we traditionally know as, uh, know as the code words, okay? It's all very nice in theory, but we don't really know how to do this yet. Uh, there are no known methods to pick code sets, and uh, we've thought about it a little bit, and we have some crazy ideas, but they're not working yet, so I'm not gonna talk about those. But I'm going to tell you how you can use traditional coding in certain contexts to solve this. And the trick is, if you do have, if you had a noiseless channel, so if the DNA st strands you retrieved here were guaranteed to be exactly the ones you put in, so no 
no noise, no, no, uh, no substitutions, deletions, and insertions. You know exactly what you put in is what you get out. So that's a noiseless version of that. Well, then there's a simple trick you could do. Uh, so some of the DNA st strands you will never get, but the ones you get, you, you know that they're the ones you put in. Okay. Then, um, well, you could, have, you could separate your DNA strand into two parts, the prefix, and the prefix simply runs through an index sequence, 0, 1, 2, 3, et cetera. And then the rest of the DNA strand would, uh, would, would, would be normal symbols of a code word. And the way it works is that that first portion simply encodes the position where you are in a code word. Okay. This is a nice way to explain things, but it's essentially equivalent to fountain coding or indexed read solemn coding or indexed random linear coding. Okay. So the surprising thing, and that's, that's where, where, where uh, um, we already have, I mean, David already had, had a result from the beginning, saying that actually this is optimal. For the noiseless case, it's optimal. So fountain coding or index read solemn coding uh, is optimal if you have a noiseless channel. For the noisy channel, it's not. So this is now our current system. Our current, because the problem is it's very nice to, to know what the real problem is in theory, which is finding a code set encoder. But at EBI, I have a, a boss, and the boss wants me to implement the system now. He doesn't want to wait for the theory to, to, to bear fruit. So we need to build a system. So the, the system we're building is based on this, on this part here, which is a noiseless case. Even though we know that things are not noiseless, the DNA strands we will retrieve will have errors in them. But we're doing what we can. And essentially, the, the idea here is to have a two-tier system. The first one is a packet encoder of the either fountain coding or read solomon, uh, read solomon coding type, then insert the index, okay? And then because we know our low level channel is not noiseless, put in a very strong lower level encoder to recover, to, to recover with a very high probability for many mistakes, okay? So here we, we do it, we're doing a type of noisy fountain coding that's already been investigated by um, Venkia Pouyan de Clerc. Uh, who've, who've written two papers on that, and Venkia did his PhD thesis. And the, what they found, and what we all, all also found, is that if there's any mistakes in the index, you're lost. Okay, so you, you, if, if mistakes are in the, in the code symbol, then you can do all sorts of clever things, but if the mistakes are in the index, you're completely lost. So um, the index portion needs perfect protection, because if, you, if, 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 if things get out of order, you're completely lost. So, that's not, we know that that's not the optimal thing. So the graal of noisy DNA would be to have a true code set encoder, but that's what we're currently working on. Okay, so I'm already getting to the conclusions. I hope I wasn't too fast. No, it's okay. I am a bit fast, all right. We'll have more time for discussion afterwards. Okay, so uh, the current work that we're doing on this is a channel measurement and estimation. So we need to characterize our DNA channel. We're doing experiments to, to measure uh, probabilistically, when you talk to molecular biologists, they tend to tell you, well, insertions, they happen sometimes, and deletions, they're quite frequent, but not too frequent. So we need to know exactly what that means, basically, in order to be, in order to be able to make statements about what happens at error regimes of 10 minus 9. We, knew, we need to know this exactly. We're evaluating a, an array of low-level codes, okay? Uh, marker codes, watermark codes are all from, from David's past work, and, and convolutional codes as well an array of packet encoding methods, fountain codes, and actually indexed read solomon codes, which in this context are sort of fun because they're actually um, um, optimal in the sense that if you want to uh, encode a file of, of n packets, you really only need to recover n packets to get it, which is very, very pretty, and it actually works. And the nice thing in this context as well is that in the context of, of, of archiving, when you anyway have to wait uh, hours and days and weeks to get your, your synthesis and your sequencing, it doesn't matter if you're running, if you have to run a computer for five hours to do the decoding. It doesn't add much. So there is no, there's relatively not many complexity constraints compared to normal archiving uh, and, and storage, uh, um, storage applications. Unequal error protection for the index is, is, is the other thing we're looking at. And then, as I said, we have some crazy ideas for direct code set coding, but this is the open problem in this talk. So if anybody has crazy ideas, by all means, email them to me. And I thought I'd finish on some ethical questions that are a little bit cheeky, going back to the saving the planet 
version is that, well, if mankind is doing so badly, maybe we shouldn't be storing our information for whatever comes after. Cause <laughs> <laughs> and then the other thing is, uh, how will future intelligent life know how to decode the Reed-Solomon code? It's nice that they get to the DNA, but will they have discovered Reed-Solomon codes? And finally, who says we're version 1.0? We could be version 7.0, and instead of trying to store our data, we should be looking for existing data in DNA. Perhaps somebody's handed it down the generations for us already. <laughs> Um, we have probably time for a few questions, and um, yeah, John. So rather than storing it in soup, uh, what happens if you store it in living creatures, like say cockroaches? What's the yeah. Um, so the ethical implications of doing that might be it might be a problem, but that's a, that's that's something that 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 could be interesting. So store it, for example, in in, in um, junk DNA in living creatures. Uh, yeah, it, it's an interesting question. I, I wouldn't do that personally, but, but <laughs> you should put the question to the, to the biologists, whether they'd be willing to do that, but I don't know. And whether, is, whether a creature could then survive with that, whatever your favorite JPEG or something uh, in, in, its, <laughs> in its DNA. Yeah. I, along these lines, it, it could be that, you know, when I, the question I asked about who says we're version one, it could be that information has been passed down the generations, but it's been passed down in a way that will only be readable once evolution has altered the DNA to a certain extent. So perhaps in 500 years, we'll discover that the evolved cockroach DNA contains a secret message of great significance. I don't know that. Um. The, so you add basically an integer number at the start of each block that you encode this, this index to find its position in the file. Uh, another way of doing it would be to create a puzzle where you basically just add information that creates a, long, a strong link to the predecessor and the successor. Have you compared the two approaches where uh, you put in less information but you may be able to store it more strongly or do something a sort of like a convolution code to create a most likely uh, history throughout the entire sequence. So the, um, apart from the Grass et al. system and the Milenkovic et al. system, the other three have done what basically biologists would do, which is uh, take your file and encode it in overlapping packets. And that's a way of doing what you're saying. And it, this is le a lot less optimal than what we're doing. So they get, they get what they call coverage ratios of, of, of five on the order of five. And with read some code, you can actually bring it down from one point nothing. So, it, it, so they, it, yeah, it is possible to do what you do, but it wouldn't be necessarily, it, it wouldn't make the decoding easier and it wouldn't make it uh, any more optimal. It would be your kilobits per dollar would, uh, your dollar per kilobits would go Kilobits per dollar would go down. Well, uh, it was a great talk, by the way. Very, very, very informative. Um, can you give me a, um, a precise definition of the code set coding? Because you know, when you when you have a code set, um, how, what kind of a guarantee that you have that you get all elements of that set you when you are fishing? You don't. So it's 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 code set with erasures and all sorts of things. If you think here, about here it. in in a noiseless case, we consider just the erasures. Uh, so, so in, in the noiseless case, we consider that it's a purely, purely packet erasure channel. Okay? Mm -hmm. And you have the set of all possible packets, okay? and your code word is selecting a subset of those. So the code is the set of subsets that you might right. be selecting. Right? And the idea is that these subsets are somehow separable. They don't need to be non-overlapping, but they, they're separable so that if you uh, depending on the rates that you, so, 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 so the information theory looks very precisely at these rates. So depending on the rates that you might, might achieve, and it may be very, very tiny rates, it may be that you'll recover only, a, as you would in phantom coding actually, a very, very tiny subset of the subsets of the, of the code set, uh, that it remains 
recognizable, that the, that the subset selected remains recognizable from that. So in a way, if I think of the code set as a code word, and I don't fish all the elements of the code set, it's as if in the code word I have had erasures. It's like a packet erasure. All right. Okay. Exactly. Interesting. Thanks. Um, hi. So I was I was just wondering a little bit about the decoding. So so say a civilization finds this DNA in a piece of glass in ten thousand years time. Um, how do you how do you kind of store the instructions on how to decode that? Yeah, that, I think I think some people have given thought to this. Actually, I, I haven't really. Uh, I did ask this question here: Will future intelligent life know about Reed Solomon code? So that's that's the coding system that you've used. Will they know how to do that? So people have given that some thought, like having some mechanical paper or carved stone thing explaining uh, how to. By the way, the picture is from the fifth element, if you may, may notice. So the, the, I mean, there, is, there are even films that speculated about things like that, right? So, so you could have some, some, some instruction manual that's understandable with a little bit of a lower intelligence, and that will tell you, that will, that will keep the instruction set. I, yeah, I'm not sure. Be interesting to, to look into self-explanatory systems. Where does the limit of uh, 200 base pairs come from? Uh, synthesis and sequencing. Uh, currently, synthesis is, is, our, is where we, we are at the limit. But planning uh, for the long term. Sequencing limits, but there are, there's, there's different sequencing technology, and they have different uh, packet lengths. So in the future, do you think that will get, that'll get longer, right? I don't know about synthesis. I don't know. So far, there's the, the, the various synthesis techniques that exist don't really don't really make it much longer. I know that sequencing, there are actually sequencing technologies now that make it much longer. But you have to be a little bit careful when you talk about sequencing because here we're doing, in a way, blind sequencing, uh, whereas in many se sequencing applications, you are trying to match something against some average sequence. So it's an alignment problem rather than a blind recognition problem. But yeah, as I said, there are people who are far more experts on, on DNA sequencing than I am in, in the audience. So perhaps you should put the question to them during the break. Hi, um, on the sub 10,000 year time scale, does biological storage of information in DNA molecules have any advantage over digital storage on chips? So if you're not only the people writing, but you're also the people reading, is there any advantage to doing it that way? Sorry, I'm, uh, could you keep the microphone? Because I'm not sure I understand your question. I, I, what do you mean is, by is, is longevity of information storage the only advantage you're talking about here, or is there something else that I've missed? So, I, I put two advantages. One is longevity and the, the possibility, but the main advantage was essentially that DNA. That we have a natural interest. All living species would have a natural interest to read DNA, uh, whereas. You know, ability to do to read optical disks or, or magnetic storage might have vanished and never come back. So that, 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 yeah. okay. All right, great. Let's thank uh, Yossi.